The Hubble Space Telescope has found what appears to be the most distant star ever detected. It was found in a galaxy a whopping 12.9 billion light years away. And that means we're seeing this star as it appeared less than a billion years after the Big Bang. The discovery was announced in a new paper by Brian Welch et al. in the journal Nature. They found the star while using Hubble to search for galaxies in the early universe that are being magnified by gravitational lenses. Gravitational lenses allow us to glimpse objects that are otherwise much too far and too faint to be detected. In this case, the star was found in a galaxy that existed when the universe was less than a billion years old. Gravitational lenses have revealed galaxies that are much further back in time, but this is the earliest epoch of the universe that we've ever seen a single star. For this reason, the team dubbed the star Arendel, which is the old English word for morning star. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. There's the gravitational lensing, how they figured out the background galaxy's distance, and how they know that this tiny blob of light is actually a star within that galaxy. So let's break this all down. First, there's the whole gravitational lensing thing. It's a prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity, which states that matter and energy bend the space-time around it. Anything traveling through that curved space-time, including light, finds its path deflected as well. Now, if the lensing mass and the background object are both concentrated, and the background object lies directly behind the lensing mass, then the light from the background object will get distorted into a perfect ring of light called an Einstein ring. We sometimes see Einstein rings in nature when a background galaxy lies almost directly behind a massive, compact foreground galaxy. But to gravitationally lens the very weak light from a very distant galaxy, you need the mass of an entire foreground cluster of galaxies. But those clusters are lumpy, with blobs of matter here and there. So instead of a ring, the background galaxy gets distorted into several arcs of light. Exactly how those arcs are formed depends on the geometry of the alignment and the distribution of matter in the lensing cluster. So even though the galaxy doesn't look like a galaxy, you can still measure the redshift of the light in the arcs and from there determine from what time period in the early universe the light is coming from. And that's because the farther away a galaxy is from Earth, the faster the universe's expansion carries it away from us. The faster it moves away from us, the more its light gets stretched out to longer or redder wavelengths. So by measuring the arc's redshift, we effectively work out how early in the universe's history we are looking. Now by early universe, we're talking about a time frame starting around 400 million years after the Big Bang. Our best understanding is that that was the time when the universe cooled enough for matter to clump together to form the first stars. And those first stars would have been ionizing the surrounding hydrogen and helium gas. And that's why this epoch is alternately referred to as the Epoch of Reionization or the Cosmic Dawn. To that end, astronomers have been using Hubble as part of the Reionization Lensing Cluster Survey, or RELICS. The idea here is to obtain infrared imaging of the most massive galaxy clusters to look for the brightest and highest redshift gravitational lenses. In 2016, Hubble imaged one of the lensing clusters called WHL0137-08. It happens to feature a particularly long and bright arc with a redshift of 6.2. That's a high redshift. It puts the lens galaxy at approximately 12.9 billion light years away. Or put another way, about 900 million years after the Big Bang. Since that puts the background galaxy close to the cosmic dawn, the Relics team dubbed the arc the Sunrise Arc. But how do they measure the redshift of the arc? Well, normally that's done by taking a galaxy spectrum and measuring how much its spectral lines are shifted from their known rest wavelengths. But that technique only works if there's enough light available to get a good spectrum. Even though the Sunrise Arc is considered bright for a gravitational lens, it's still much too faint for Hubble's spectrographs. However, we can take advantage of the fact that the light from the original galaxy will pass through clouds of hydrogen gas on its way to Earth. As it does so, hydrogen absorbs light at a particular set of wavelengths. Now, for simplicity, I'm just going to show one of those shorter wavelengths here. 
As the light travels through the universe, it redshifts and carries the absorption line to a longer wavelength. But hydrogen in the next cloud absorbs the light that has now shifted into this special wavelength and produces another absorption line. By the time the light reaches another cloud, the first two lines have shifted further into the red and a new absorption line is created behind them. The process keeps repeating until over time the spectrum starts to build up a forest of repeating hydrogen absorption lines. The higher the galaxy's redshift, the more of these clouds its light had to pass through and the thicker the forest becomes. In fact, you can really see this effect when comparing the spectra of two quasars with different redshifts. The higher redshift quasar is missing much more of its shorter wavelength light. Now, the sunrise arc is too faint for Hubble to take a spectrum, but this same phenomenon means that as the redshift increases, the galaxy starts to fade away at shorter wavelengths and is only visible at longer or redder wavelengths. So if you take multiple images of the same galaxy through different filters in Hubble's camera, you can estimate its redshift based on what wavelength the galaxy remains visible. This is a technique called photometric redshift. Now, in fairness, it's less precise than spectroscopy because each filter allows a range of wavelengths to pass through. That makes it harder to know exactly what wavelength the light was being cut off. Still, the results converged on a redshift of about 6.2. Now, that's a real whopper of a redshift. So the team made some follow-up observations with Hubble in 2019 to try to get some more light and glimpse some details within the arcs. Now, typically, arcs will show repeated images of the same feature within the background galaxy. And those images are created in a pattern. If you recognize the pattern, you can figure out what features in the galaxy they belong to. For example, these three blobs in Cyan are a set of images coming from one star-forming region in the background galaxy, while these three blobs in Magenta are coming from another cluster. But then there's this tiny bit of light in the arc that turns out to be the star Arendelle. Now, how could they possibly know that this faint poof of light is actually a star in the background galaxy? Well, this is where it gets really cool. All of the arcs and features are caused by the various clumps of matter in the lensing cluster. By analyzing how these features are arranged, you can map out where along the face of the cluster the matter can create the strongest possible magnifications. These trace out lines called critical curves, and the result looks a little like a contour map. In theory, a point source of light located directly on this critical curve will become infinitely magnified. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen because there are no zero volume point sources of light anywhere in the universe. But a small source like a star can easily get magnified by thousands of times if it happens to fall close to this line. In fact, we can see this effect in a swimming pool on a sunny day. The ripples in the water concentrate the sunlight into a network of bright regions at the bottom of the pool. Likewise, the critical lines of a gravitational lens trace out the rippled spacetime of the lensing cluster. Arendelle appears directly on or extremely close to one of the critical lines. The team calculated that this rare alignment is magnifying Arendelle's light anywhere from 1,000 to 40,000 times. That's an insane amount of magnification. Arendelle's location on the critical line explains why there's only one image of the star instead of two or more. The images of the background star are so close together, they appear as a single point in the Hubble image. So the region of space it's coming from has to be really small. Now, exactly how small depends on how you model the lens, and that's because each model makes certain assumptions about the distribution of matter and dark matter in the cluster, and the alignment geometry of the lens and the background star, and many other factors. Using different lensing models, though, the team found the radius of the region couldn't be any larger than 0.36 parsecs. That means the diameter of Arendelle's region of space is no larger than 2.3 light years across. Now, for comparison, the distance between the Sun and the next closest star, Alpha Centauri, is about 1.3 parsecs or 4.3 light years. Now, obviously, star clusters can fit many, many more stars into a small region of space. But even the smallest, most compact star cluster we know of has a diameter of about 6 light years across. 
Arundel's estimate maxes out at just two light years, or one third the size. Now, to be clear, nobody thinks Arundel is a single star with a diameter of two light years. Rather, the volume of space it's located in cannot be any larger than two light years across. Now, that's still large enough to accommodate a new kind of ultra dense cluster of stars. And that's not completely implausible either, because the universe was a lot smaller and had a higher average density back then. However, Arundel appears faint despite being magnified many, many more times than the surrounding cluster images. And that means Arundel has to be much less massive than a cluster. So working backwards, the team estimated that Arundel's mass has to be somewhere in the 50 to 100 solar mass range. Now that's insanely massive for a single star, but again, that's not unheard of either. And besides, high mass stars would have been more common in the early universe. And sure, there's enough mass and more than enough room to make Arundel a binary or even a triple star system. But the thing about those massive binary systems is that typically one of the two stars is much more massive and luminous than the other. So even then, the light we are seeing is probably coming from just one of the stars in the Arundel system. But there is another possibility. What if we're just being fooled? What if Arundel isn't really a star in the source galaxy at all? Well, the team wondered about this as well. If Arundel really was a, let's say, a dwarf galaxy in the lensing cluster, then its redshift would be much lower than that of the rest of the sunrise arc. In fact, the team managed to rule out an interloper this way. And that leaves another possibility that Arundel is actually a faint star or even a brown dwarf in the Milky Way, and it just happens to have the same red color as the rest of the arc. However, the chances that a star of any kind, let alone a red dwarf, would happen to line up with both the arc and the critical curve by random chance works out to be around 0.01%. It's not impossible, but it's very, very unlikely. Still, the only way to know for sure is to take a proper spectrum of the star. Not only would that tell us what kind of star Arundel really is, but it could also directly measure the redshift as well as the redshift of the rest of the arc. And that's why the same team are going to use the James Webb Space Telescope to do just that. If Webb confirms that Arundel really is a star in that distant galaxy, it could settle the most provocative question of all. Is Arundel one of the very first generation of stars to form in the universe? It's an exciting prospect, but I wouldn't be surprised if the answer were no. Arundel's redshift puts it at around 900 million years after the Big Bang. Now, even if it were only a 50 solar mass star, it wouldn't have been around for very long. So it had to form at about the same time it was discovered. Meanwhile, the very first stars would have formed around 500 million years earlier. Such stars would have been made of pure hydrogen and helium. They also would have been extremely massive, weighing in from a hundred to possibly a thousand times the sun's mass. After just a few million years, these megastars would have ended their lives in titanic supernova explosions, creating the first elements heavier than helium. We call those elements metals. Those metals would have been blasted into the surrounding interstellar medium and triggered the next generation of star formation. Now, given that Arundel didn't form until 500 million years later, it wouldn't be surprising if Webb finds metals in its spectrum. But even then, we'd want to compare Arundel's spectra to the spectra of stars that are around today. All of the second generation stars that are still around today are low mass dwarfs. Anything heavier than eight solar masses would have exploded as supernovae long before the sun ever formed. So how exciting would it be to find the kind of star that led to the creation of our own. Before I wrap up, I wanna say a huge thanks you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is a learning community with thousands of online classes and members from 150 countries who come together to find inspiration and to level up their creative game. One of my goals for this year is to learn how to create better animations and graphics for my videos. That's why I'm enjoying Adobe After Effects CC for beginners 
hosted by the hilarious Jordi Vanderput. And then there's loads more advanced classes on After Effects and the rest of the Adobe Creative Suite that I use, but don't really know how to use well enough. New premium classes are launched each week and are presented ad-free, so there's always something new to discover while staying in the learning zone. If you're ready to level up your game, the first 1,000 people to use this link or my code Launchpad Astronomy will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Make sure to use the link in the description of this video. And my very special thanks to my patrons for helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy going. And I'd like to welcome Ben Degen, Thought Chocolate, Tabor Gotchman, Kangrang, Max, Nikhil Sharma, and Mache Volska as my newest supporters. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay curious, my friend.